One of the earliest memories any initiate has with the temple is their first visit to Master Yoda's quarters. Situated in the central shaft of the High Council Tower, the quarters served as the Grand Master's home for centuries. Unlike any other personal chamber, Master Yoda had a distinct crest on his door. Anakin and anyone else he'd spoken to about it, didn't know the language though they guessed it belonged to his species. Whenever someone asked him what the two glyphs meant, Master Yoda simply smiled and answered, from my past, it is. The purpose of the visit was the same as any other early sample of Jedi life, to show them something important for their future within the Order. A sort of test run for initiates to get a taste for how lightsaber training is performed or what subjects ranging from galactic history to law and beyond they would have to study. The visit to Master Yoda's quarters was different from all the others. There was no flailing around awkwardly for the first time with a training saber or staring at data pads with endless information. With the Grand Master of the Jedi, you simply sat down for an hour, drank some tea and talked to him. What interested you in the studies you'd seen so far? Did you get along well with your fellow younglings? Is there anything troubling you that you wish to share? These were just some of the questions Anakin himself recalled when the time came for his first visit. The point was to show all Jedi they could approach Master Yoda for anything troubling them, for wisdom, comfort or simply meditate in his company. Of course, Anakin proved himself outside the norm even in this regard. For him, the experience was awkward, to say the least. The Jedi Council had left far from a good first impression on him, sensing into his feelings, his fears and bringing them out into the open. Master Yoda more so than the rest. From the very beginning, there was something different about him in comparison to any other Jedi Anakin met then and even now after thirteen years in the Order. It was as though he could sense you from anywhere, as though he was able to look into your very soul, whether you wanted him to or not. This alone would have put Anakin on edge. But it was far from the only thing. He was a new arrival, a strange boy who the masters and knights whispered and talked about. Nine years old Ad completely ignorant of the fundamentals his peers already figured out years before, but unlike them, already had a master to teach him whereas they would have to work for years to possibly get their own. If they weren't sent to the Jedi service court that is, to make things even more complicated, he was profoundly feeling the absence of his mother. To the point where he couldn't sleep sometimes. He missed Master Qui-Gon too and remembered how he just laid on that slab, burning away with an almost morbid detail. Combine absolutely all of this with the mind of a nine-year-old boy who couldn't articulate half of these things even if he tried to and it was little wonder his visit to Master Yoda all those years ago was stiff, awkward, fraught with anxiety and fear. Fear of them probing inside his head and fear of his worries. That was the day Anakin began practicing his favored approach with Master Yoda and soon the rest of the council closed off and respectful deference. He would practice how to speak to them, how to hold himself in their presence, memorize the words necessary to give off the impression of a perfect Jedi initiate, then proper Padawan and lastly, Knight. Instead of working, however, Anakin only became more anxious around them, a self-terrorizing voice in the back of his head always telling him they could see just how fake he was. It was only now, as he and Obi-Wan drew closer, Yoda's quarters and all these thoughts and memories came back to him that he couldn't help but shake his head. How foolish he was. Youth and foolishness are frequent partners, Anakin. There is no shame in them. Obi-Wan sensing his thoughts didn't surprise him in the least. He wanted to practice a bit of transparency on his end for Master Yoda. Falling into old habits was unacceptable that day. Only if you learn from it, Master. Something I've only just started getting around to. True acknowledgement of one's mistakes constitutes progress already. If you keep at it, sure. Do you intend to do otherwise? Not a chance. Then you've nothing to worry about with Master Yoda. Though Obi-Wan didn't say it, he remembered a certain phrase of him quite well, there's no need to consider it. Until the possible becomes actual, it is only a distraction. Be mindful of what is, not what might be. Though, in this case, it would be more accurate to be mindful of what is and not what was. In less than a minute they'd reach Master Yoda's quarters. Before either one could knock on the sliding, crested doors, Master Yoda's muffled voice called out to them from inside. Enter, you may. Sharing glances, Obi-Wan smiling while Anakin took a calming breath, the door split apart and the familiar surroundings came back into view. 
The quarters were hexagonal with shaded windows casting pillars of shadows from the orange and yellow sunlight entering the room. Like all Jedi quarters, Master Yoda's were bare with only small pieces of furniture, an organiform table, a small bed, and three meditation pads. On the one opposite the door, sat Master Yoda with a cup of tea in his hands, his legs crossed and back held straight. His small cane within arm's reach. Though he was small, Master Yoda radiated a presence in the Force unlike any other. Anakin had sensed his strength in the Force before, or at least he thought he did. Even in this relaxed position, exerting absolutely no effort whatsoever, Anakin felt as though he could see Master Yoda properly for the first time. There was power there to be sure but not just power. Centuries of wisdom, experience, leadership, entire human lifetimes a dozen times over encapsulated into a single being, radiating from him with the same warmth the sun radiated heat. Good morning to you, young Obi-Wan and Skywalker. He greeted them with a small smile and inclination of his head. Good morning to you as well, Master Yoda, Obi-Wan began while a moment later Anakin stopped staring and did the same, almost saying it in unison with his master. Spent much time with clones you have, he let out a small laugh, sipping his tea, giving no indication visibly or through the force he caught Anakin gawking at him. Soon, march together in a formation you will. Well, we are fighting in concert quite well, Obi-Wan said with a faint smile. Served you well it has, Master Yoda swept his hand at the vacant meditation pads. Come, come, sit you may. Too long since we have enjoyed each other's company, it has been. They bowed in thanks again, Obi-Wan sitting in the middle chair while Anakin sat opposite the Grand Master. Once again, he took a calming breath and began to speak when his perceptions picked up on something else in the room. Something faintly but strongly pulsating in the Force. Anakin was too preoccupied to notice it a moment ago, the small, single alteration in the entire room, a vase on the table with a flower on it. A rare species it is, far from the unknown regions. I'm sorry, Master. It's just. There's nothing else on Coruscant like it. It feels so. Different in the Force. Plant life in general didn't have a great presence on Coruscant bar parks and some stretches of land spared from Pomacrete buildings. Not that Hanukkah never paid much attention to forests or trees or flowers, his passions always laid in more mechanical areas. Now, his recently changed Force perceptions sensed Master Yoda's flower pulsate through the air as if it glowed even in the incorporeal world as well as the physical one. Quite so, Master Yoda finished his tea, walking over to the table to leave the cup behind. Surprising it is to see you notice, young Skywalker. Let's just say, Anakin shared another glance with Obi-Wan. Certain things have changed, Master. For the better, I assume? He climbed back into the meditation pod, tiny green legs crossed and arms rested on their knees. So far, Anakin admitted. Now was the time. No more distractions like pleasantries, courtesies, jokes or small talk to forestall what had to be said. On an old instinct of fear, he ever so briefly considered trying a way to get out of it. To twist the truth in enough of a way to avoid saying what he had to. Instead, Anakin remembered his talk with Obi-Wan and fought against this old reflex. He felt Obi-Wan's reassurance through the Force, a pillar that had always supported him even if he was too blind and stupid to know it fully until now. With a calm, steadying breath, he simply let the burdens of worries and what-ifs go. Whatever happened next, happened next. Yesterday, you no doubt noticed my absence from the Outer Rim Siege's briefing. Noted, it was. There's a very good reason for that. After Dooku escaped us on Tithe, I was. A mess, angry, worried, acting disgracefully for a Jedi Knight. Obi-Wan and I talked, about many things, Master. Openly, honestly and certain things have come to light. For both of us. Master Yoda's expression was of a thoughtful frown. Obi-Wan gave an encouraging nod to go on. I know that you and Obi-Wan have been aware of my feelings towards Senator, no, Padme. I know you've both covered for me all this time, even after I broke the Jedi Code and for that. I am truly thankful, to both of you. But it's time I shared with you how far this relationship goes. Padme and I are married, Master. We've been married for three years since the Clone Wars started. It was a secret ceremony, just the two of us, R2, 3PO, and a Pontifex. Yoda's expression stayed the came. 
save for a momentary glance at Obi-Wan and an almost imperceptible twitch of his ears, one would think the Grand Master was made of stone. Even in the Force, his thoughts and feelings were kept well hidden. Great your trouble must have been, young one, for this truth to come out. I didn't have to say anything, Master, Anakin promised. From the way the conversation went, I could have kept silent, kept my secrets. But I. It didn't feel right, it didn't feel fair to Obi-Wan. Now, I'm telling you as well, you and then the rest of the council. Trust, Master Yoda said, his voice grave and a little. Sad? Yes, trust. Important it is, for Jedi to have in one another. In these trying times, especially. Yet, more there is, you wish to say, hmm? There is, Anakin nodded, feeling emboldened by now that things were underway. Yesterday, just before I went to address the Senate, Padme revealed to me that she's pregnant, for several months now. Silence fell, neither one Jedi Master said anything. Obi-Wan momentarily looked dumbstruck but soon rallied and Anakin felt his happiness for them through the Force and he was very thankful to his teacher in ways words could never describe. Master Yoda remained neutral and frowning. The frown was still there. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Anakin, for the last time, fought the urge to hold back his thoughts or feelings. This was too important for the future of his children to mess up by acting like a frightened, nine-year-old boy would. Even if he was kicked out of the order, he would do it with dignity and on his terms. Right you are, young Skywalker, much has changed, a great breach of the Jedi Code, this is. I'm aware, Master, Anakin's eyes never left Yoda's, but even still, sitting down while saying what he had to didn't feel right. Before continuing, he rose from the meditation pad, positioned himself on the small crest between the three seats and knelt. And I am sorry. Sorry if I've disappointed you and for keeping this a secret from you. I know you voted for me to join the Order and to become a knight. Anakin bowed his head. I am willing to accept any punishment you choose for me, Master. All I ask is that it comes after the war, for even if you kicked me out right now, I couldn't stop myself from trying to protect the people of the Republic. Jedi or no Jedi? Such a choice, mine it is not to make alone, young Skywalker, Master Yoda's cane poked him in the left shoulder. Nor would I cast you out if the choice mine to make it was. Rise, you may. Feeling inexplicably lighter, Anakin did so, allowing himself a sigh of relief. As did Obi-Wan, though he was far more subtle about it. It was very hard, though, to stop himself from smiling. Thank you, Master. Thank me yet, you should not. A matter for the Council, this is. Informed of this, they must be. Master Yoda poked the cane into Anakin's stomach with every other word for emphasis. Of course, Anakin nodded, ignoring the small flashes of pain from the jabs. I meant what I said, whatever the Council decides, I'll accept it. I only ask that you wait until the war is done if I am to leave the Order. Last night, I had. Strange dreams. You're having nightmares again? Obi-Wan asked, concern evident in his voice. Not like with my mother, no. Back then, I just thought they were dreams but they were flashes of the present, what was happening to her back on Tatooine, from our bond in the Force. This was. Different, scattered but still, chilling. Doubt that I do not. Subjects of these dreams, what were they? Death and destruction, Master. Everything I saw was of violence, fear. It was as if all the worst things in the Clone Wars one experienced so far flashed through my mind, except worse. However, I believe these images and sounds were of the future. Certain, you sound. One of the things I heard was Padme screaming, Anakin said, recalling her voice in vivid detail. I'm not sure if it was from childbirth or terror but when I woke up, she was perfectly fine. A dangerous thing, premonitions are. Often, what we seek to avoid, we create instead. And the force, so very clouded, it has become. Master Yoda's voice grew more distant with every word, his thoughts and feelings trailing off somewhere else. Somewhere in the vast currents of the force. It was widely known his abilities in this regard were virtually unrivaled by any other Jedi in the Order. The fact Coruscant had become so poisoned by the dark side was proof of their enemy's awareness of this. Anakin usually found this ability disturbing. Now, however, something strange happened. Where Yoda's perceptions stretched, Anakin could see. He could follow them, as one would follow the trails of an animal they were tracking. 
a whole web of connections suddenly grew before his eyes, passing on into a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand directions. All of them letting one feel the living creatures within the web. All of them promising insight, of the past, present and possibly even the future. Or at least, they would do the latter. Everywhere Yoda went and Anakin followed, Fogg sooner or later descended on them, obscuring clarity and leaving Anakin with an itching feeling inside his throat. Then he sensed a change from Master Yoda, surprise. Suddenly, the web of currents faded and Anakin was back in the room. Before him, Master Yoda sat, with wide eyes and perked up ears. Faintly, he was aware of Obi-Wan glancing at both of them. Whatever had transpired now, his perceptions weren't privy to. An interesting meeting of the council, this will be, Master Yoda spoke, tone a strange mix of distant and amused. Very interesting, indeed. Before either Anakin or Obi-Wan could say more or ask questions, the Grand Master rose to full height and gently hopped down. With every step towards the door, his cane rhythmically resounding thumps against the permacrete floor. Come, young ones, come, the meeting soon will be. Anakin stared on, still reeling from what just happened. He'd never, not even with Obi-Wan, ever experienced something like it. He didn't even think it was even possible to experience it. A touch on his shoulder snapped him out of the trance. His old teacher stood at his side, smiling openly and an open hand outstretched. Congratulations my friend, from me and Master Yoda. Though he does not say so. Anakin laughed, shaking his hand. Thanks, Obi-Wan. From me and Padme both. Time for congratulations, later it will be, Yoda glanced at them over his shoulder. Much to discuss, remains. Smiling, the two ended the handshake, leaving Master Yoda's quarters behind them. Following a short walk and turbo lift ride, they reached a small corridor just ahead of a lobby leading to the High Council chamber. On both sides of this corridor, transparent steel windows flanked both sides, allowing for a view of Coruscant reserved for only a handful of individuals in the entire galaxy to use at their leisure. Anakin had never taken much of a chance to enjoy it, truth be told. His aforementioned council-related issues always made him too nervous. Now, with the early morning sun on the horizon under the clear blue sky, he would stop to look once his business there was resolved. The High Council chamber remained the same as always. Circular shaped with high arched windows giving an even better view of Coruscant and a ring of twelve cushioned chairs. One for each member of the Jedi Council. It had been a while since Anakin had seen the full body in session, even longer since all of them were even present in the flesh. Today was, unfortunately, no different. Masters Windu and Arjun Kalar were there in person while Masters Kiadi Mundi and Plo Koon used their respective seats built in hollow projectors to attend. The rest of the seats were vacant entirely. Good morning, Yoda said first, with Anakin and Obi-Wan follow suit. The attending masters returned the greeting, though Anakin felt their surprise at his presence. He stood close to the door, while the others sat themselves down. Apologize I do for being late, Master Yoda hopped into his seat next to Master Windu. An important matter with young Skywalker and Master Obi-Wan discussed I did. And it seems he has much to discuss with us as well, Master Plakoon's deep, modulated voice spoke, his gaze on Anakin from across the room. He confirmed the Kaldor Jedi's assessment with a nod, only stepping forward to the center of the chamber when a gesture of Master Yoda's hand prompted him to. Anakin stood there hands at his sides, breathing calm. Peering out into the Force, he felt the silent support of Obi-Wan and Master Yoda, the curiosity of Masters Kiadi Mundi, Arjun Kalar and Plo Koon and the intense focus of Master Windu. What I'm about to say, he began with a clear voice, making eye contact with all of the assembled Masters, thankful that all of them were sat fairly close to one another and in front of him. Will displease you, I'm certain of that. Master Windu's eyebrow imperceptibly raised, Masters Mundi and Arjun Kola frowned, Master Yoda and Master Plo Koon were carefully neutral. Obi-Wan momentarily smiled and Anakin felt the urge to as well, it wouldn't be the first time something he'd done would earn him some ire from the ruling body of the Jedi. But he fought against doing so, the only thing he did from that point on. Opening him up fully to their perceptions, making himself as open the numerous transparent steel windows letting the sun shine into the chamber, Anakin spoke long and without pause. It was a struggle, Mace admitted, keeping himself measured through Anakin Skywalker's revelatory monologue. 
or the fact Skywalker was revealing himself to such a degree at all. While he was open towards their perceptions as an untrained initiate, as time went on, he adapted a staunch respectful but stiff and decidedly awkward stance towards the council, always leaving the impression of someone uneasy, afraid and hiding something. How true the last of those three was now with everything laid bare. This time, Skywalker had taken his practice of flagrant rule-bending or breaking to the next level. Marriage and romantic relationships in which he actively partook, even becoming a soon-to-be father, went against one of the core rules of the Jedi Order. It was grounds for dismissal from the Order itself, permanently. Never mind the fact he married a senator, one of the most prominent and outspoken ones in the entire Republic. Yet there Anakin stood, open and calmly explained when this relationship with one Padme Amidala began, how their secret marriage ceremony went and thus explained numerous instances of his absences from the temple whenever the war didn't need them. At the end of his explanation, Skywalker revealed he was to be a father and very soon from what he knew, of twin children. And he was not at any single point anything but completely honest with every spoken word. It was one of the reasons Mace found himself conflicted as to what to think about this entire situation. The breaking of the code was unacceptable, plain and simple and would surely cause many issues between the Jedi Order and the Naboo system when the truth became known across the galaxy. Yet, he could not bring himself to fully condemn Skywalker. The first reason was his conversation with Obi-Wan about secrets between Jedi never left his thoughts. He had spoken with Master Yoda the evening prior about that very same stance. It was even their joint intention to speak plainly with the other council members, to reveal themselves, their mistakes and the true severity of the danger present to the Jedi Order and the Republic. The second reason was him. Understanding Anakin's feelings. As the young Jedi spoke more and more, there was an honest, deep passion behind his words, even a slight smile playing around his lips when he revealed the pregnancy. Mace knew precisely what it was, for it was something he felt as well deep down and never admitted openly to anyone throughout the many years of his membership within the Jedi. But not for any individual or even the Jedi Order. No, it was something far greater. Mace Windu loved the Republic. The pillar against savagery and barbarism, civilization in its most tangible and perfected form. It was for this reason he so deeply felt. Wounded by the squabbling of the Senate, the tolls of the Clone Wars and the ruination of what he considered most important and he had never said a word of this to anyone, not even Master Yoda. Mace even came to realize that he envied Anakin Skywalker, for the young man was honest about his feelings and seemed to thrive from it. I am sorry, Masters, Skywalker had reached the end. He knelt and made eye contact with all the other Jedi. Sorry if I've disappointed you and for keeping this a secret from you. Anakin bowed his head. I am willing to accept any punishment you choose for me. Masters. All I ask is that it comes after the war, for even if you kicked me out right now, I couldn't stop myself from trying to protect the people of the Republic. Jedi or no Jedi. Silence fell on the council chamber. Master Yoda and Obi-Wan knew of this already and so the matter troubled them not, their minds were already made up. Arjun Kola, often known for his blunt honesty sat with his fingers interlocked, a frown of deep consideration present. Though he always viewed the Jedi Code as paramount, the Zabrak Master was also incredibly compassionate towards his fellow Jedi. Even when it appeared as though Quinlan Vo had fallen to the dark side, Arjun always restrained himself to avoid hurting a brother in the Order. Master Kuhn remained calm, though even his demeanor momentarily shook with Skywalker's revelations, the Keldor Jedi was also known to deeply value all life. He was among the generals closest to his clone troopers, after all. Anakin, it was Master Mundi who broke the silence. No one was surprised by this. Rise, I would ask you a question. Of course, Master Mundi, he did so, turning to look at the Syrian Jedi. Your marriage to Senator Amidala, would you consider it a boon to your work as a Jedi? Have you grown as an individual with her? Has she grown with you? Is this simple romantic attachment or something more? Skywalker considered the words, a thoughtful frown stretched across his face. It was another strange sight on the young man known for diving headlong first with a reckless abandon surpassing even Qui-Gon Jinn's. I don't remember exactly how it goes but I believe there's a saying in the Order, about masters and apprentices, that the most important lessons a Jedi Knight learns come from one student, that the two form a bond of mutual partnership, benefiting each other. 
I suppose I could describe my marriage with Padme in a similar way, he smiled again. In fact, everything I'm doing here today is what I imagine she would do, were our roles reversed. She would plainly, bravely say how things are, humble herself and accept whatever came next. Though, she would worry about it beforehand. The Syrian smiled faintly then too. We haven't been together much but she's helped me, so many times to get through the troubles of this war. In ways, no one in the Order could, not even Master Obi-Wan could, no offense. None taken. So yes, I do believe there is something more there, Master. I believe that I would be a far, far lesser man without Padme Amidala in my life. I believe, Master Plo Koon spoke next. That the matter of young Skywalker's status within the Order should be put aside, for the time being. We can scarcely afford to lose him now. And if the matter was to be settled now, Arjun Kolar inquired. Where would you stand? I would reprimand young Skywalker here, most certainly. Breaking of Jedi Code is no trifling matter, it must come with certain punishments. However, his voice took on a gentle tone as it could, given the mask. Anakin has shown great maturity and progress here today. His actions complement the sincerity of his words and in these dark times of uncertainty, it is refreshing to see something like it. Master Kola, still unusually quiet seemed to consider these words, his eyes meeting Anakin's. I believe I share the same sentiment as well. As things stand with the Order, we must unite and stand together, even if one of us errs in his ways. Anakin inclined his head in respectful acknowledgement and thanks to their contributions. Leaving Mace the only one left. On a purely practical level, they couldn't kick Skywalker out, even with a unanimous vote. How many times have he and Obi-Wan together or individually turned the tide of a seemingly unwinnable battle, saving countless lives in the process? That alone ruled out even entertaining the notion of his dismissal, until the war was over, at least. However, this cold, purely practical idea. It did not sit well with Mace. The other masters were in their ways correct, the times were dark and they as Jedi must stand together. Not because of practicality but because of unity and brotherhood. And then there was the fact Mace found the idea of a potential down-the-line dismissal leaving him with a sour taste in his mouth. For how long did they want to see Anakin Skywalker become the Jedi they all, to varying degrees suspected he could be? The man he could be? Was he going to tomorrow, next week or a year from now, reward genuine progress with such a severe punishment? The answer was a firm no, but he wasn't going to let Skywalker completely get away with it either. Sharing a glance with Master Yoda, Mace moved on to speak when the Grand Master gave an acknowledging nod. Anakin Skywalker, Mace looked the young man in the eye and found him looking right back, entirely calm and fearless. Though you have broken one of the core tenets of the Jedi Code, I do not believe it wise to dismiss you, today or even after the war is won and the Sith threat disposed of. There were rumblings of agreement from almost everyone there in the room through the Force, Anakin remained neutral. As though he knew that was far from the end. However, such a breach must come with punishment as well. For while you have shown great maturity with your actions today, there is no guarantee other Jedi can attain it as well. Or that they may grow from their marriages as you have. Therefore, I propose a ban. A Jedi Knight you will remain but only a Jedi Knight, you will be unable to attain the rank of Master for the next ten years. If you attain the rank of Master one day, then you will not be legible for membership on the High Council for another ten years. Mace looked to the others present in the Council and almost like a group of clone soldiers, their hands went up at the proposal. Even Obi-Wan's, though he and Mundi both gave Anakin sympathetic looks. Skywalker himself made no reaction to the unanimous vote. Whereas other knights or masters may balk or be even momentarily discouraged by such limitations imposed on their advancement within the Order, Skywalker did no such thing. Instead, he simply bowed. I accept your punishments masters and I thank you for letting me remain a Jedi Knight. The Council collectively accepted this with nods, approving of this latest display of maturity. Skywalker, however, did not excuse himself. Instead, he rose to full height and exchanged a look with Master Yoda, asking for permission. It was granted to him. His so far impeccable calm gained a companion, a slight hint of grimness, giving him a faint scowl. Yesterday, he spoke up with a cooler tone. I had strange dreams, almost nightmares of dark things, masters. I dreamed of the sounds of blaster fire, 
multiple lightsabers carving through the air and meeting one another, I smelled burning permacrete. I felt lightning, like Dooku's from Geonosis, see me. I heard my wife screaming in terror. Premonitions of the future, young Skywalker believes they are. I've experienced dreams of the present, of places and people far away. I don't believe this was one of those. Padme was sleeping soundly right next to me and there was no danger around us. If I recall correctly, Obi-Wan spoke up, stroking his herd. When the Separatists attacked Kamino, you foresaw the future as well. Me crashing into the sea, I believe? It was, though obviously nothing bad came of it, they exchanged brief smiles. Skywalker sobered quickly. But this was more intense, I think it was the dark side, masters, affecting me while I slept. Did these dreams persist throughout the whole night? Master Plo Koon inquired. Skywalker shook his head. No, master. I fell into a meditative trance, I focused on my family through the force. They were pure in it, untouched by the dark side. I slept soundly for the rest of the night. Better than I have in a long while, in fact. As Anakin spoke, Mace peered closely into the force, for the shatter points and the fault lines of destiny connecting them. He saw the young Jedi in a different light, shatter points of his previous fears and anxieties vanished, replaced by fewer ones, for his family, for the Jedi, Obi-Wan and Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Small flaws in his structure, ones Anakin was aware of and kept in greater control. Yet as he spoke, the flaws seemed to glare back at Mace, all of them were even for the briefest moment, intensified by these premonitions. He then looked past just the young Jedi Knight and sensed, even in the blackened fog across the Force, that Skywalker was right to worry. Whatever these premonitions held, they were tied to important fault lines, ones potentially leading to imperative events yet to play out in this conflict. They could not simply be dismissed so readily. They also meant the time had come for Mace to take the floor. After a nod from Master Yoda, he did just that. Have a seat, Anakin, this concerns you as well. Skywalker looked surprised by this, not that one could blame him after just being eligible for a place on the council. But with a nod, he did so and sat next to Master Mundi, in Susitin's vacant spot. Mace positioned himself where the young man stood moments ago and took a single, long breath. I too have a secret to share, he spoke calmly, gaze passing over the chamber and making brief eye contact with everyone present. One of great importance and one I and Master Yoda both have kept from you. A secret that never should have been one as it concerns the very future of the Republic. For keeping it, I must apologize for myself and Master Yoda. Coerce me, you did not, my friend. Be that as it may, Mace bowed his head for all to see. I let my fears rule me when I should have trusted my fellow Jedi, I cannot apologize enough for it. The assembled Jedi acknowledged his apology, though only Obi-Wan and Master Yoda were not surprised by the way this conversation was going. Their surprise would grow more, possibly into outrage for one particular individual. The secret is. Relations between the Supreme Chancellor and the Council have deteriorated. Substantially. Over the past few months, Palpatine has either gone against our wishes, ignored our advice or outright ignored us. When we have advocated for other resolutions to the war, peaceful ones, he has forestalled any such attempt. When we have tried to voice our concerns about the Security Act and the troubling things done in service to it, we are ignored. When we've tried to broach the subject of his emergency powers and the flagrant disregard for the very constitution of the Republic, he's waved us aside with the same answer, when the war is over, I will step down. But how can a war end, how can true democracy be established again if the same man promising this is doing all in his power for the war not to end? I have. Anakin spoke leaning forward and struggling to speak. Mace was not surprised by this. A calming breath helped carry him on through. I have seen the Security Act in action myself, this morning, in fact. A baker, a moon baker, was detained by a squad of clone soldiers just on the basis of his species. They would have sent him to prison for questioning if I hadn't intervened on his behalf. What was the squad commander's reason for this? Master Kuhn asked. He said separatist agents and potentially subversive individuals, dangerous to the security of Coruscant were most frequently belonging to species at war with us presently. When I asked him for information to corroborate how valid this claim was, he refused to tell me, saying it was classified. Classified? Master Mundi repeated, mouth hanging open momentarily. 
You were a Jedi Knight, a general in the Grand Army of the Republic. That's what I said too but he wouldn't budge. If I hadn't pulled a mind trick on him, the baker would be rotting in a cell now, Anakin grimaced. Or worse. I asked the baker for more information about these arrests. He revealed to me a neighbor of his, a Rodian, was sent to prison after another squadron picked him up one night. The man just left his home for a while after a fight with his wife. The baker mentioned raids on homes too, always on non-humans. Looking for more subversive elements. Arjun Kalak included. The man didn't lie to me, I could sense it. In fact, the more I felt around the people of Coruscant around us, I sensed a profound fear from aliens. Towards humans and especially towards clones. The humans meanwhile. Disdain them, they do as young Skywalker knows, Master Yoda spoke up, his voice as grim as his expression. Long has this simmered, throughout Coruscant. Strengthening the dark side of the Force, it has. We once thought it was a byproduct of the war, Mace said. However, recent discoveries afforded to us thanks to the efforts of Anakin and Master Kenobi through the Mechno chair have brought to light a far more disturbing truth behind these events. Behind the very war itself. During our investigation into the identity of Darth Sidious, we discovered that he and Count Dooku have been meeting in secret, right here, in the works of Coruscant for years now. Mace did not need the Force to know what they were all thinking, what they were all feeling. Personal experience and all that. As we looked for the trail to Sidious, we crossed through the winding, abandoned tunnels underneath Coruscant and the trail ended. At 500 Republica. That cannot be. Arjun Kala said, as bluntly honest as always. Obi-Wan and Master Yoda knew already and it did nothing to mask their own worry about this fact. The other present Jedi reacted as Mace expected them to, stunned silence. They all knew full well the implications of this. To make matters worse, Mace's voice turned grim as well. The moment we began to get closer, to perhaps even capture or kill Sidious, the attack on Coruscant occurred. I had to leave the rest of my team to protect the Chancellor. By the time the battle was more or less over, I discovered that the investigation team was butchered in my absence. In such a way nothing but the Force could have caused such injuries. What Dooku told me three years ago was true, Obi-Wan reminded them somberly. The Sith Lord is here, has been here for years now and is in control of the Senate itself. Deception with the truth. Master Mundi said. And we thought it so impossible. I believe the proper term for it is arrogance, Master Kuhn said with a bluntness expected of Arjun Kola. Instead, the Zabrak master sat in pained silence, as though a saber was cutting at him from the inside out. You think it's Palpatine? Anakin spoke up again, silently watching everything around him with a frown of deep concentration. Behind this, Mace and all the rest felt what was going on inside him, pure, raw disbelief. Because of his emergency powers, the Security Act. You think he's the Sith Lord? It was not a question so much as a statement. If he was asked this yesterday or any other day, he may have held back, lied to himself out of some desire to face an uncomfortable truth. He was sorely tempted to do it now as well, for to admit such a thing would mean the Republic was for all intents and purposes, already gone. Yes, it was a painful thing to admit. Regardless, Mace locked eyes with the young man and continued speaking honestly. I cannot be certain if he is, however, if it turned out to be the case, I would not be surprised. Anakin exhaled, loudly and shakily. He felt beyond uncomfortable, outright sick. It became hard to breath, to calm himself down. The urge to shut himself off from them, for them not to sense or see what he thought about all this was sorely tempting. The shame he felt at the temptation to lash out at them, to call them traitors, separatists and a whole slew of other things only made him feel worse. Leaning back into the chair, Anakin breathed in and out, trying to center himself again but it was hard, so very hard. Until Obi-Wan reached him, placing a comforting hand on his shoulder. He didn't say anything, instead, he simply smiled and let Anakin feel him through the force. As always, his old master was the calm eye of a storm, a solid foundation in a whirlwind of chaos raging from Anakin's almost palpable anxiety. Soon, he was joined by Master Yoda as well than the rest of the present Jedi. Latching onto them, letting their calmness seize his troubles, Anakin's breathing became less ragged, the twisting in his gut eased up. I'm better. I'm better, he gave them a tired smile, feeling positively exhausted. Thank you. 
understand your troubles, I do, Master Yoda's voice took on a softer touch. Many years of admiration I have for Chancellor Palpatine. Yet ignore recent events, we cannot. I understand, really I do, it's just. Palpatine is your friend, Obi-Wan said not unkindly. And you cannot bring yourself to think of him that way. Anakin nodded, finding it easier to calm down all on his own again. It is not easy, Mace Windu said with a soft voice as Anakin had ever heard from him. To face the realization one you consider a friend is in actuality your enemy. Heavier blow, it is, Master Yoda's ears fell, making the great Jedi look much older and infinitely sad. Anakin knew at once who they meant, Sora Balk, Master Balaba, Dooku, and who knew how many other Jedi brothers and sisters. Even with this profound sympathy for them and thankfulness for their support, Anakin couldn't bring himself to believe Palpatine was a Sith Lord or Sith accomplice. No, until he saw with his own eyes. Which he dearly hoped wouldn't happen. I understand your suspicions, Masters, I agree that the situation with Chancellor Palpatine looks bad, he took another calming breath and made it a point to make eye contact with all of them. However, what if this is simply another ploy of the Sith? What if the Sith is somehow contriving circumstances to paint Palpatine as a threat, turning us against one another while the real enemy laughs at us behind our backs? It could be true, Obi-Wan said, ever the one to look for the brighter side of matters. Who is to say the Supreme Chancellor is not under the sway or control of Sidious? Perhaps unknowingly at that. The dark side is capable of many dark, forbidden arts and it swirls about the whole of Coruscant perpetually. It is also just as likely Master Kola spoke up. That Palpatine has lost his way in the midst of chaos and war and Sidious is merely using this opportunity to deceive us. Palpatine is pressing his advantage further, still, Master Windu's voice regained its grimness. From the few senators still friendly with the Jedi, before this meeting, I have discovered that another amendment to the Security Act will come to pass today. Through it, Palpatine will attain direct control as Supreme Commander of not just the Grand Army of the Republic but also the Jedi Order itself. Anakin felt as if he'd been struck again and so did the rest of the assembled Jedi. Even Obi-Wan and Master Yoda sent a ripple of palpable shock and disbelief at this revelation. Keeping himself centered, Anakin let his gaze go across the vast Pamakrete and Durastiel of Coruscant, all the way to the Senate Dome off in the distance. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, he said almost absent-mindedly, eyes locked onto the place where the Chancellor was currently at, pushing this amendment to the Security Act. We can sit here and speculate until the sun dies out but I'd rather find some answers. You may be the only one who can, Master Windu said. If there is any Jedi left on Coruscant, the entire galaxy, with whom Palpatine's relationship has not deteriorated, it's you. Investigate the residents of 500 Republica, we must, Master Yoda emphasized every word with a cane stab through the air. Continue allowing Sidious manipulations from there, we cannot. The Chancellor will listen to me, Anakin assured them, feeling quite certain about it. Once I explain to him the importance of this investigation, he'll listen. I know he will. Assuming he is not working with or for, the Sith Lord, Master Rajan said with the blunt honesty of a Vibramis. If the Chancellor has been lying to us, the entire galaxy for over ten years now. And to him, Anakin thought, hoping dearly this wasn't true, that it was only a Sith plot pitting good people against one another. Then I will do my job as a Jedi Knight. The wait was insufferable. Moments seemed to go on for minutes which seemed to go on for hours and so forth within the council chamber. At first, Obi-Wan did not notice this, not while they still spoke. Firstly of Palpatine and his potential connections to Sidious. When did the Supreme Chancellor seem to go awry? Were there signs already present but ignored before the first blaster fires of the Clone Wars were unleashed on the galaxy? Other possible suspects fitting the measurements taken by the initial search party were Vice Chancellor Marsa Meda and Advisor Sait Pestage in the event Palpatine was only a distraction, witting or unwitting ally of the Sith. When this became a circular act of endless speculation, the conversation turned to the war. Where had they last been? How many enemy troops did they face? Where was the situation most dire? Yet this exchange ended fairly quickly. Hearing about the endless plights of battlefield after battlefield was hardly a subject to keep one's spirits or in Obi-Wan's case, worries to rest. And so, the assembled Jedi simply sat in silence, not even meditating, while they awaited Anakin's report. I should have gone with him, 
Obi-Wan thought and not for the first time. Only hamper young Skywalker, you would, Master Yoda said with a meaningful cane jab through the air. More he will learn on his own. An apprentice, he is no longer. Yes, I seem to keep forgetting that. It's a wonder he hasn't told me off himself yet. Perhaps he would if he did not feel he still had much of worth left to learn from you. Master Kuhn offered. Obi-Wan accepted the compliment with a nod, though it did little to improve his mood. For years now, he momentarily smiled. We've spoken, no, argued about politicians at length. I've always had a certain distaste for them, while Anakin has always advocated in their favor. Who he used to speak favorably of the profession went without saying. I fear what this will do to him. Palpatine and he have always been close, closer even than the two of us until very, very recently. I almost wish that for his sake, Palpatine has nothing to do with this. The sight of him shaking, looking physically ill remained vivid in Obi-Wan's memory. His friend always did believe in people above all else, before abstractions such as rules or politics or ideologies. To him, the worth of such intangible ideas came from the people enforcing them. It made him impossibly loyal to others. But it could also cause great pain if one's trust was misplaced. It would be best for all of our sakes, May said, running a hand over his bald head. A Sith Lord or accomplice or pawn leading the Republic. It would be a disaster of unimaginable proportions. Cloaks and daggers, Master Kala said with a grimace. At least the Sith of old had enough courtesy to fight us out in the open. Deception and treachery, always have been the tools of the Sith, Master Yoda reminded them. They expected the Grand Master to continue this train of thought, instead, he looked away, his breathing heavy. Yet these new Sith. Different. There is a cunning there unlike any the Jedi Order has faced. Centuries ago, our first clue of the dark times ahead we received, yet we know, I too foolish to see then, I was. To realize that the Sith have transformed, evolved, while we have remained the same. Leaning back into his sit, staring thoughts far away to a place only known to him, Master Yoda seemed less of a Grand Master. A being of unparalleled renown and skill with a lightsaber and diplomacy with nearly a thousand years of experience and wisdom and more of a very tired, very old man. We've not lost yet, Master, Obi-Wan reminded him, feeling the urge to rally, to look at the bright side in spite of the creeping shadows. Someone had to when the rest of the room seemed equally grim. If he could not help Anakin, he could try to help them. Despite the challenge, and the hardships this task will bring him, I do believe Anakin will bring us closer to the truth. Master Yoda's ears perked up and though he did not smile, he accepted the encouragement with a nod. This is why I've used meditation or preferably sparring to keep myself distracted, for a while, at least. Master Windu stated. A distraction would be welcome, Obi-Wan admitted. But, I wish to be here when Anakin reports. Master Kuhn and I will gladly spar with you, Master Mundi offered with a not too subtle smile. Isn't that right, old friend? Certainly so, Master Kuhn nodded, just the barest hint of amusement in his modulated voice. The thought accomplished its intended effect, getting a small but mood improving laugh from all those present. They held on to this feeling, letting the ebb of time perceptibly return to something approaching normality until at last, half an hour after Anakin left them. The hollow projector from above beeped. A moment later, Anakin's blue image crackled in the center of the room, all eyes trained on him. Anakin, Obi-Wan said, leaning forward. Are you all right? More or less, Master, he looked around, looking better than Obi-Wan expected, almost happy but worse than he hoped. What have you managed to discover, Anakin? Master Windu inquired, leaning forward in his seat. His old apprentice didn't speak immediately, instead. His mouth opened and closed, clearly struggling to articulate what transpired. Don't rush yourself, my friend, Obi-Wan gently helped him along. Gather your thoughts and speak. Since the beginning of his time in the Jedi Order, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine's office was a frequent visiting place for Anakin. He'd gone there dozens if not hundreds of times, each one leaving him feeling better than the last. Unlike the temple, where Anakin felt the need to be on guard with almost everyone, constantly hiding his worries and fears from the prying eyes of the Jedi, this office within the heart of the Republic, was always open to him and Anakin welcomed any chance to enter it. The Supreme Chancellor was a friend in the true sense of the word. Anakin could tell him almost anything about himself and his life, save for one exception, 
which was a hundred more things than he felt comfortable telling even Obi-Wan. Instead of lectures about the code, about holding up some ideal he, until very recently, didn't even understand, he received sensible advice. Human advice, from someone who understood the fact Anakin was someone with an ordinary life not struggling with one quite unordinary. Even when he told him of what happened to his mother, the circumstances of her death and his subsequent revenge on the Tuscan, Palpatine was there. He didn't lecture him, didn't scold or look disappointed or disgusted, as Anakin for the longest time thought Obi-Wan would, he just put a gentle hand around Anakin's shoulder and let the boy already off to war cry his eyes out. These were the memories Anakin's almost on an uncontrollable instinct tried to fall back on, to shield him from what his eyes were clearly noticing. There was a gloom in the room. He wasn't sure if it came from the multitude of still-smoking buildings from outside the gargantuan arch window behind the Chancellor's desk blotting out the sun or from the lamp discs. The lights were bright, almost harshly so, intensifying the gloom with shadows throughout the entire room, even with broad daylight just outside. The color red permeated throughout the entire room. One of two carpets, all of the walls, the ceiling and the two guards flanking the entryway towards the desk were all red. The exact same shade of red, every one of them. Even the exception, a circular white carpet beneath the desk and guest chairs which stuck out only intensified the room's dominant color. Anakin couldn't help but find it all disconcerting. No, he was wrong. There were four objects which stuck out from the red yet complemented it perfectly. They were large, taller by two heads than Anakin himself and Golden. He vaguely recalled the Chancellor telling him about them, when he was very young, they reminded him of many statues built inside the temple. Though, he couldn't remember what or who they were, taken an interest in sculptures. Chancellor Palpatine's pleasant voice said from the desk, casting a friendly smile at Anakin. As he looked at the chair where the Supreme Chancellor sat, moments ago busy with a data pad from some remaining business left to sort out, Anakin noticed it casting a wide shadow against the sun's shine. Seeing him there, behind the chair, he realized what this place reminded him of now, the general's quarters from the invisible hand. It was a good thing Anakin kept his force shields up and his perceptions trained only on his immediate surroundings. Master Yoda warned him explicitly to keep them focused on his immediate surroundings, never to go farther and that they would speak more of it later. Still, even this intentionally limited view left him profoundly sensing the dark side of the force through the air not only in the office but before he even set one foot within the Senate building itself. Feeling something in his gut twist, Anakin smiled ruefully and kept looking at the statue, hoping to mask his worries and suspicions by focusing on the statues. The Chancellor emerged from the chair shadows and with a few steps stood next to Anakin, joining him in his apparent admiration. The four sages of Dwartii, Palpatine said with admiration, drawing out the words ever so slightly. Great philosophers and lawgivers from the early days of our fair republic. Much of what we have today is from their efforts. I remember you mentioning they were controversial. For certain, why, some would say they were little more than a cruel cabal advancing the interests of their own kind at the expense of others. Many of their laws were thought of as needlessly cold and unsparing. Theirs was a different time, wild, untamed. Palpatine smiled faintly. Though, some may perhaps say the same for us as well sometime in the far future. They resemble Jedi. Quite so, he nodded, turning about the room with a sweeping gesture at each one. Fea, Sistros, Yanjon, and Brata were well versed in the arcane arts as well. Some say they were force sensitive as well, using its powers for their own political ends. A fact I believe Master Yoda once told me. Anakin made a mental note to verify this. As the Chancellor moved about, he scanned the other statues just a bit more closely, finding all of them vaguely unsettling, particularly one of Sistro's. The dark hood casting a shadow over his non-existent face and arms clapped together in long robes reaching to the ground made it seem as though the statue was hiding something terrible. Ignoring this, Anakin looked back to the Chancellor. How are you, sir? I'm sorry for not asking at once but it's no trouble at all, he waved the apology aside. Before answering, he addressed the two red guards standing motionlessly at the entrance, almost appearing as another set of statues. You may leave us, with such a capable Jedi Knight by my side, I will be in no danger. Bowing deeply, the red guards left, their red capes flipping through the air behind them. The effect of their silent exit was only enhanced by the fact they didn't make a single sound when leaving. 
The Chancellor's hand came to rest on Anakin's back, guiding him to one of the guest seats. I am as well as can be, my friend, he answered, smiling though with a wearier tone of voice. You will not be surprised to learn that I did not sleep well at all last night. Nightmares, sir? Anakin asked, taking a seat in the chair while the Chancellor sat at his desk. Once more reminding him of the invisible hand. Restlessness. After such a horrible day, my mind kept wandering about, as it often does recently. So many things to consider, so many possibilities, so many dangers. I fear sleep will continue to elude me until this war has come to an end. And you, my friend? Me? You seem a bit. Disheveled yourself. Distracted, asking me about statues and history. Anakin, not for the first time, wished Obi-Wan was there. Though he would definitely be appalled by the statement, Obi-Wan was far better with these kinds of things. Diplomacy, dialogue and keeping his thoughts and feelings carefully controlled or under wraps. Someone with the inability to fence with wordplay wouldn't get the unofficial title, the negotiator, after all. Even when he supposed he was a decent liar, Anakin was never even close to reaching that level of skill nor did he try to. If only he could go back and smack himself in the face with his metal arm. But, he had seen Obi-Wan do it enough times. Play the fool, perfectly pretend obliviousness over something obvious to throw whoever he was negotiating with to overplay their hand and then throw the rug down from under them. His philosophy with lightsaber fighting was identical. Consistently, there was something a pattern, Obi-Wan never lied, not completely anyway. Depending on how hostile someone was to him. Obi-Wan adopted varying degrees of honesty, oftentimes using one truth to shield another. He vaguely recalled asking him about it one time, how a negotiation was similar to a battle. That it was never a goal in itself, just a distraction to mask the true goal and was best countered by another distraction. It was time to put theory into practice. You're right, sir, he let out a genuine breath, feeling the weight of everything upon his shoulders. I am distracted, there's a lot on my mind. I'm always here to listen, Anakin, he leaned back into the chair, hands spread as if waiting for an embrace. It was a gesture he'd seen before but cast against the seat shadow. Anything I can do for you, anything at all, simply ask and it's yours. Anakin didn't even let himself think what he'd like most. It has to do with the Security Act, sir. I've heard. And seen troubling things concerning it. Raids on people's homes, random people being interrogated and thrown into prison. It is an unfortunate consequence of the war, Palpatine sighed, hands resting at the arms of the chair. I must like these precautions as well, they are a terrible thing to do to citizens of the Republic. And yet, we must protect ourselves from any blind spots, lest our enemies strike us from the shadows and we are left completely unawares. I understand that, sir, but I feel that they're being taken too far, and with apparent bias against the non-humans of Coruscant and not just members belonging to the separatist species either. At those words, there was a flash of pure anger across Palpatine's face, unlike any Anakin had ever seen before. His kindly old man face contorted into a contorted grimace and the scowl alone made him reflexively lean back into the chair, as though he were about to be struck. It vanished just as quickly it came, leaving the Supreme Chancellor pressed against the chair, shoulders slumped and looking impossibly tired. I apologize for startling you, my boy, he regained some strength following a deep breath. This matter. I have known about it, though only recently. When I discovered such actions against the citizen of our republic, it was all I could do not to. He trailed off, shaking his head. It took every bit of self-control Anakin had not to rush over to him immediately, to forget the doubts of the council and to end this line of questioning right there and then. But he knew he couldn't do it. Because of Master Windu, Master Yoda, Obi-Wan. They wouldn't have sent him there if they didn't know something foul reeked from the heart of the Republic, something only he could discover. But neither could he appear heartless, to just sit there when the Supreme Chancellor, his friend, was in pain. Lifting himself off the guest seat, Anakin went to the Chancellor's side and placed a hand on his shoulder. The effect was immediate, Palpatine lifting his head and giving him a thankful smile. You are very kind, Anakin. I must apologize again for distressing you so. It's no trouble at all, sir, you've done it for me too. Many times. Removing his hand so as not to tempt fate, Anakin watched the Chancellor swirl the chair around and rise to his feet. With a gesture, Anakin followed him toward the vast window showing Coruscant under them. 
Arthur stood there, in silence, Palpatine enjoying the view while Anakin waited for the right opportunity to speak again. Ultimately, he didn't need to. Today, the Chancellor said with a clear, strong voice. There shall be another proposed amendment to the Security Act. Through some of my own loyal allies within the Senate, I have discovered that they mean to grant me absolute authority over the Republic's military, Republic intelligence, and the Jedi Order. Anakin tried his very best to look and sound surprised. Really? But that's been under consideration for a while? He smiled faintly. Yes, and given the recent circumstances on Coruscant, I can hardly blame people wanting to put an end to the squabbling of the Senate. None are more knowledgeable about that particular subject than I am, I assure you. You'll accept? I have no choice. Though some call me a self-serving warmonger, I do intend for this war to end, in the shortest order possible. But I would be lying if I claimed that was not the only reason for it. Tell me, the Chancellor looked him in the eye. Are you aware of the situation between myself and the Jedi Order? I am, Anakin said without pause. Obi-Wan mentioned that relations between you have become strained, recently. Unfortunately so, he sighed, shaking his head. Should this amendment pass, I hope to put an end to it. To repair relations with the Jedi, to eliminate all roadblocks keeping us from cooperating plainly with one another. Through those same means, I also wish to bring the Republic intelligence into this fold, to ensure everyone knows what everyone else is doing at all times and to put a stop to unsavory actions done without my knowledge or cooperation. Like the raids and arrests on non-humans. For a start, yes. It all sounded wonderful, Anakin thought. His own disdain for the Senate was known by quite a few and the idea of a good, capable man cutting a swath through it all to get things done properly was an idea he could stand behind. If this conversation happened days ago, Anakin would have unquestioningly accepted this explanation and go on with his life. Secure in the knowledge order was about to be restored. The luxury was lost to him now. What the Chancellor didn't understand was the fact the roadblocks between him and the order would not be removed with this. Only intensified. They believed he was a self-serving warmonger more than possibly anyone else. Then the amendment might come at the perfect time. Oh? I didn't come here just to see you, sir. He almost added as I always do but stopped himself. The Jedi Council has recently made a great breakthrough in their search for the hidden Sith Lord. Through the Mechno Chair, Obi-Wan and I recovered from Newt Gunray, and Master Windu's inquiry, they've tracked the trail of Darth Sidious. To 500 Republica. Are they certain of this? Without question? Absolutely, sir. Dooku has been moving in and out of Coruscant for years now, from the Lee Merge building in the works. The dark side of the Force was strong there. The Council suspects they were the ones who supplied General Grievous with the hidden hyperspace lanes to attack here. Palpatine didn't say anything, didn't so much as flinch. He just stood there, watching Coruscant's damaged life go on and on. The signs of his true feelings were only revealed in his minute movements. The slight shaking of his hands hanging helplessly at his side, his mouth subtly trembling and eyes rapidly blinking as though to fight back tears. He didn't even look angry, just profoundly lost. No, hopeless. It was even more difficult for Anakin to stay on course, this time. Gently, awkwardly, he put another hand on the Chancellor's shoulder. This time he didn't even smile, just letting out a hitched breath. All this time, he drawled out in a nearly lifeless voice. All this time, the enemy has been here and I? Th the fool. I did not even realize it. It's not too late, sir, Anakin said after swallowing a lump. We can still capture Sidious. All we need to do is run a thorough investigation of everyone who lives in 500 Republica. I'm sure we'll find something, some clue to hunt down the Sith Lord. You have my permission, no, my support, he turned to face Anakin, his complexion not as pale and a determined fire in his eyes. Whatever the Jedi Order requires to root out this creature, this fiend no doubt corrupting the very pillars of democracy. We cannot hope to end this conflict so long as this. Darth Sidious lives and breathes. The Chancellor assured me we'd receive full cooperation from the residents of 500 Republica along with absolute support from himself and the Republic intelligence forces. Silence fell upon the council chamber once more, expressions and thoughts of surprise permeating through the air. None more so than from Masters Yoda and Windu. Indeed, it was almost comical from the way their Grand Master's ears were perked up. 
his eyes widened before eventually settling on his almost signature, thoughtful frown. Master Windu's surprise was far more restrained, almost entirely missable if one did not catch it at the proper moment. He too settled on a frown somewhere between thoughtful and intensely suspicious. It did not help Anakin himself looked. Conflicted. Did you sense anything amiss with Palpatine? Any deceit from his words or thoughts? Master Windu asked. Anakin shook his head. None whatsoever, though I must stress again. It was difficult for me to talk to him like this. Certain you seem, that something remains strange. I cannot deny what I saw in the office, Master Yoda. That place. It looked sinister by itself. Even through my dimmed perceptions of the Force, I could feel the dark side swirling about that place. Throughout the entire Senate building, in fact. I would have spent my whole time there shaking if I fully tried to reach out. Still, this is progress. Earlier it remained highly dubious any investigation would come to pass at all. Now, there is an opportunity where once was nothing. Well said, Master Kenobi, Master Windu inclined his head, a sly smile playing on his lips. Which is why I propose you be one of the ones to lead the investigation. Of course, he answered immediately, trying very hard not to think about all the time about to be spent meddling with politicians. My perceptions are not as keen as other Jedi but I will do what I can. You're a friendly face, Obi-Wan, Anakin said smiling and looking back as his old self. Obi-Wan did not like it. And you have a way with words, you're perfect for a softer touch. Which is why I will join you, Master Windu's smile was gone, replaced by his usual sternness. With my ability to sense shatter points and disposition, I will be the perfect counterbalance to our negotiator. A third member of this party, I recommend, Master Yoda's pointed look at Anakin left Obi-Wan's old friend looking decidedly surprised. An unseen role, serve you will. Unseen? Arjun Kalar asked while Anakin remained silent and dumbfounded. A great change has occurred in young Skywalker here. Where once he only sensed the Force in the basest of ways, now his mind, expanded it has become. Is that not so? I suppose. There is no suppose, there only is. Anakin wisely remained quiet. Your entire life limited your view of the Force has been stifled, by your own actions and fears. Afraid you have always been to open yourself, to allow the thoughts and emotions of others to become known to you. Even those closest and partially, our fault it is and corrected it shall be. You're not. Wrong, Master Yoda, Anakin said with a heavy breath. After letting Obi-Wan know about. Everything, it's like something just. Clicked inside my head, like a switch I never even knew about. The living force, Obi-Wan said with a knowing smile. That is what you have become in tuned with, to the very life of every creature you can reach out to. Sensing what they feel, how they feel. It is the acceptance of what is, not what may be. Master Qui-Gon was also highly attuned to it. He always let it guide him. Through proper training, greater mastery to this attunement of the force, you will attain. While Masters Windu and Obi-Wan question those of 500 Republica, you will perceive their true intentions through the Force, a playful smile graced Master Yoda's lips. Training I shall give you. Located at the base of the temple, on the northwestern side, the Room of a Thousand Fountains was a seven-story tall greenhouse whose wooden doors were immediately identifiable. From the entrance, several stone and dirt paths split off into dozens of directions. Benches lined every one, giving hundreds of spots to sit down and relax. Between these pathways, there were thousands upon thousands of exotic plants from all over the galaxy. No matter where you went, the soothing sounds of nature trickled on endlessly. Anakin rarely went there. His way of meditating was building or repairing anything he could get his hands on. When he was younger, it was usually a droid or gadget. As a grown man it meant minutely improving his starfighter's performance until it felt just right. If that was out of the question, sparring was the second best option. He stood at the entrance, staring as fellow Jedi young and old walked past him. The sheer contrast between the greenhouse and the Chancellor's office astounded him. There was no permacrete or durus steel there, no sinister architecture looming large and no fog of the dark side to choke on. It was a whole different world, no, a different galaxy from the rest of Coruscant combined. Though Master Yoda requested his immediate presence there the moment he returned, Anakin took his time reaching him. There was so much to see, to smell and to feel. Tentatively, 
he stretched out through the force and basked in the vitality coursing throughout. It was as though looking through a kaleidoscope, countless colors, and patterns intermingling in ways no physical object could portray. At one point, on the second floor, it became so overwhelming Anakin shut himself off. Otherwise, he'd become completely overwhelmed. Master Yoda waited for him on the third floor, at a crossroads where the stone pathways split up into six directions. He resembled a statue with his eyes closed, legs folded, hands resting atop knees. He didn't even seem to breathe. A quick look through the force indicated they were completely alone on the whole floor. Enjoy your walk, young Skywalker. I did, at first, anyway, he walked up to the Grand Master, mirroring his body stance. It's so, different. Quite so, Master Yoda spoke without opening his eyes. Great fondness for Coruscant I have. Yet, more areas such as this one would be appreciated. I think most Coruscanti would be shocked if they stepped through here. An unfortunate truth, this is, he inclined his head ever so slightly. Yet not for you, hmm? It's a reprieve, Anakin breathed out, almost shivering from the Senate building. That place, it's like being thrown back to Omadun. No, no, worse. Deadlier than any gas or poison cloud, the dark side is, Master Yoda's frown deepened. Too long has it lingered around us too long for us to pierce without the destruction of the Sith. At least, in the grander scheme. Anakin said nothing, though a feeling told him they were about to begin whatever this training was. Tell me, young Skywalker, do you recall such a strong attunement to the Force from your childhood? It's difficult to say, he answered, searching for the answer through memories of a place best left forgotten. Tatooine is a barren planet with less life in its entirety than this single floor. Live in the Barrens, you did not, however. Moss Eisley, I believe the name was? He thought harder, fighting through the trained urge to avoid going back to that place. With a series of calming breaths, the fears associated with Tatooine ever so gradually faded. Thanks in part to the effect of Master Yoda's presence. Faintly, distantly, he could recall a profound sensation from when he was a small boy. It felt as though an explosion shook him entirely, leaving him stunned and rattled. It was no physical force, though. Dimly, he recalled it happening in the middle of Moss Eisley, probably running an errand for Watto. Overwhelmed you were by the life and emotions of those around you, a growth pain of sorts within the Force Master Yoda's calm voice broke the recollection. Likely it is, you deafened yourself to the higher aspects of the Force to protect your mind. Is that possible? Truly? Truly, he nodded. Many Jedi, when faced with traumatic experiences, perform such feats to survive. Otherwise, only death awaits them. A lesser being would have become deaf to the Force entirely. Anakin smiled wryly. Guess it's a good thing that didn't happen. Otherwise, I don't think I'd have gotten off Tatooine alive. Fortunate it is. What is not, is our inability to sense this before, of great help it would have been. Well, that is my fault. I wasn't exactly very receptive to other Jedi, even Obi-Wan, until recently. You speak the truth, partially, Master Yoda's ears dropped. Fault lies with the Order as well. Too much we have looked to the horizon, instead of what is around us here, now. A mistake born from me. Anakin kept silent, out of respect and shock from seeing Master Yoda so downtrodden. He opened his eyes and looked to the young Jedi. Not always did I rely on perceiving the future particularly when I was young, a mere two centuries old. In my youth, more prone I was to act on instinct, favoring it even. Yet, when this path brought death and destruction to many an innocent no longer could I walk it. Never had I witnessed such an event before. I thought the Republic was at peace until recently. Peace in the grander sense, yes. Yet evil has always lurked about, always present in some form, though never as great as in this current age. From this incident ever after. A strong advocate of the unifying force I became. To perceive the future in all its myriad forms and aid peace and prosperity through these premonitions. To prevent needless death and destruction before it should even come to pass. For many centuries thereafter, precisely this we accomplished. Now, we cannot do so, have not been able to do so for many years, yet foolishly clung on I did. And you believe my connection to the living force can help us get an advantage? Anakin asked hoping to help Master Yoda's mood by moving away from the troubling thoughts occupying him. 
The living force is to perceive the life of those around you, it is a gift of profound empathy. Perhaps the greatest possible expression of it. And with it, I could be able to spot out any deceit or secrets during the investigation. Quite so, he smiled, faintly. Though the living force can touch the lives of many around you, the fog of the dark side clouds even this, muddying what can be perceived through fear on a grand scale. But if I hone in on just one person at a time, in my vicinity, then impaired your perceptions, they will not be to such a degree. Though a perfect method, it is not. For not all beings are created equal and those with great prowess in hiding their true selves, a great challenge they will represent. Yet quickly we must act for the investigation will come underway tomorrow afternoon already and leave before then I must. Anakin's eyebrows shot up. Leave? How? Where? To the Kashyyyk system. Information on a separatist invasion we have attained and an important world it is for the Republic. Remembering the last reports of the Outer Rim sieges, Anakin had to begrudgingly admit the validity of the statement. Kashyyyk was a nexus for hyperlanes connecting several key routes throughout the galaxy such as the Perlemian trade route, Corellian run and allegedly some ancient routes from Hut space to the core worlds. From this system, they could outflank several key Republic fleets and even strike at Coruscant once more, if they so desired. A key system but once again, Anakin didn't know why Master Yoda of all people had to leave. Evidently the question didn't need verbal asking. Great relations I have with the Wookiees and my absence noted it must be if Sidious is to be drawn out. Then it dawned on him. Sidious knows about your familiarity with the currents of the Force. If you stayed here, he'd cloak himself with the dark side for fear of your perceptions. Of mine yes, but of yours? Familiar he is not as. That's why you warned me to keep my perceptions limited with the Chancellor and why we're training here. From inside the fountain's room, Sidious won't be able to notice my new powers in the Force, this place is shielding us from the dark side, Anakin smiled. And you'll be close enough to Coruscant to come back if something goes wrong. Yoda smiled back. Wiser you are becoming, but much to learn you still have. Then let's get to it. Close your eyes and perceive the room in its entirety. Anakin did so, relaxing his whole body with an exhale. The kaleidoscope of force signatures belonging to life around him reformed itself, dazzling in the best and worst way possible. The urge to move away from the sheer, endless vastness of it quickly came back. Focus, young Skywalker, focus, Master Yoda's voice echoed through the dazzling sensation. Find those whose signatures ripple through the force. It was a simple enough instruction but useful, Anakin felt a momentary pang of frustration at himself for not discerning it sooner. Though it seemed there was a complex weave of moving patterns all around him, most living things he could sense throughout the room were static, flowers standing in place. They only ever moved if something else prompted them to, like people walking, running or jumping in, out and around them. Anakin was curious to see what a truly static world of lush flora would look like. No sentience, no buildings, no alterations of its natural habitat in any way, shape or form. Maybe once the war was done he could afford himself the luxury. He honed in on one signature of his choosing, belonging to a Nithorian young link traversing through the upper levels with his clan. What do you see from the child? He's bored. He wants to go back to practicing with his lightsaber, Anakin said in a sleepy voice, drawing every word out, even when the child's feelings brought a smile to his face. They just had a class for basic practice. More reverence for nature his species tends to show. It's not that he doesn't care, it's just that he already knows everything his instructor is talking about. Repetition, Master Yoda said with faint amusement. The bane of many youths. His clanmate is annoyed by him, a Thrandoshan walking to his left. I think the two of them had a sparring match before. Think or no? Anakin peered more closely. That and the Athorian being a know-it-all. What else can you reveal? Anakin continued to perceive the dozens of younglings moving through groups in pairs or alone through the room's seven levels. With each one it became easier and easier to peer past the flora and move from initiate to initiate, sometimes switching his focus between floors with increasing ease. The children were, naturally, easy to sense. Their abilities in the force and ordinary mental fortitude were rudimentary at best. Even the more introverted children whose emotions and thoughts were of a slightly greater difficulty to sense out, weren't that much harder to discern. No, 
The greater challenge came from the older students and especially the adults. The Padawans who either meditated, studied or trained, naturally had greater mental shields up even while relaxing. Some of those came from inherent training, others from the Padawans' own more reserved personalities. The last group was one Anakin was more familiar with on a personal level, out of fear. The stiff way they seemed to walk or train about, the pangs of fear they seemed to have every so often whenever a suspicious sound was heard. These were Padawans who'd been on the battlefields, who tried and sometimes failed to find some measure of inner peace from it all. The adults felt similar though more intense emotions. When Anakin could discern them. These were trained Jedi Knights or Masters, men and women from across the galaxy with great mental discipline. Even inside the room of a thousand fountains, they seemed incapable or unwilling to fully relax. What this was born from was his objective and frequently, Anakin was stonewalled in discovering what. It wasn't enough to know someone was anxious or afraid, it was why that mattered most. Someone who was mentally guarding themselves and is nervous from a secret isn't the same as another person doing the same for another reason entirely. It was only when Master Yoda's voice gently urged him to stop did Anakin realize just how long they'd been at it. It was still early in the morning when they began but when he looked around, he realized it was late in the afternoon. He didn't figure it out from Master Yoda or from something tangibly changing in the room, but from the fact he recalled several initiates mentioning how it was starting to get late. In spite of this, he didn't feel fatigued one bit. Enough, I think it is, Master Yoda pulled himself up, his knees creaking faintly. Far you have come in a short time, young Skywalker. Do you think it'll be enough for the investigation? Of great help, anything you find will be, he gestured for Anakin to follow him, which he did. Remember what has transpired today, focus on the individual, ignore all distractions from within and outside, and be wary of all deception particularly those who can deceive even themselves. For those are the lies most difficult to discover. Trust in the Force and your fellow Jedi and to the answers we seek, you shall arrive. Anakin accepted the advice with a silent nod. A great many things shall come to pass soon, Master Yoda said gravely, his cane rhythmically striking against the stone. Long have the Sith machinations bore down on us, and whether they bear the fruit or not shall be determined. You believe my premonitions are of the future? Perhaps you perceived something subconsciously through the Force, perhaps the dark side merely intended to sow fear within you or perhaps both. Leaving matters to chance, we will not. No longer safe for us, Coruscant is. Anakin stopped for a moment, staring at him before rushing briefly to catch up. You mean we're leaving Coruscant? Not in great numbers, not yet but to remain here, where our enemy is in such control. Inviting disaster, it would be. The Council discussed it before you returned to the Temple, measures to ensure the survival of the Jedi have already begun. Spend the rest of the evening solidifying them I will. Are any paths left safe? Grievous and Dooku already used hyperspace lanes that were supposed to be classified. Many pathways exist through the galaxy and long has Coruscant been my home, he smiled wryly. Not all of them, did I reveal to others. Put to where our young, our future will go determined it must be. What about the Jedi already out fighting? Master Yoda sighed. Fight on, they must. Our retreat must be done in secret, an open withdrawal of knights and masters cannot happen. Not yet. But abandon them we have not, either. Warnings, only for their eyes and ears have already been sent out, to beware the clones. Once more, Anakin felt struck by the idea then hurried back to Master Yoda's side. The thought of the clones turning against them was preposterous in his mind. They'd fought together for so many years, shared so many victories and losses. For the clones to ever consider betraying them at the behest of a Sith. It was beyond a troubling thought. They walked through the rest of the third level without speaking, it wasn't until they reached the staircase leading up and down the various levels that Anakin felt the urge to ask something that he'd been meaning to for a while now. Master. Huh? Do you really think the Chancellor is Darth Sidious? The ancient Grandmaster did not answer immediately, only frowning thoughtfully up at the young Jedi by his side. He didn't immediately say yes but nor did he deny, though. The silence said much before he ultimately even spoke. Many centuries, have I lived. Many beings have I encountered. Those you may see as good and those you may see as evil and everything in between. For many years, I viewed Palpatine as one of the former yet many things have transpired that have shaken my faith in him. 
too many. I cannot say what he is, Sith Lord, Sith Puppet, a good man corrupted by power alone or a good man placed in an unfortunate situation. But? But if he is any of those first three things, then a grave threat he will present to the Jedi, to the Republic and democracy. Should Palpatine be absolved of any association with the Sith yet does not yield his dictatorial powers, move against him, we must regardless. There was no hesitation when Master Yoda said those words, he was as honest and transparent to Anakin as Anakin was to him mere hours ago. It was comforting but also frightening. Anakin almost wished Palpatine was merely being used as a scapegoat or unwitting pawn in the conflict between Jedi and Sith. He really would rather not have to fight his friend if things truly escalated to that degree. And from the look Master Yoda gave him before descending the staircase, he wished it didn't come to that either. About twenty minutes later, after wishing each other farewell and the Force being with them, Anakin and Master Yoda parted, one heading back into war while the other to Obi-Wan's quarters. Briefly, he considered perhaps practicing outside the Room of a Thousand Fountains but thought against it. Even inside the temple, the faint chill of the dark side stuck to the walls like a disgusting ooze. He wasn't about to give Sidious, whoever he was, an edge by tipping off his new perceptions. Once he arrived there, he was not surprised in the least to find Obi-Wan and Master Windu sitting across from one another. The desk full of data pads, communication links and a hollow projector installed onto it. Obi-Wan was busy running a hand through his hair when the doors slid open while Master Windu's usually stern expression was infinitesimally sterner enough to show how tired he felt as well. Good evening, Masters. He bowed. Hello, Anakin. Good evening to you as well, Anakin. I could prepare some tea. No, no, I'll handle that, Obi-Wan hurriedly said, almost scrapping the chair seat against the stone floor. Why don't you take a seat while Master Windu informs you of what we've planned so far? Master Windu observed the small scene with a raised eyebrow, one he directed at Anakin once he sat down to the council members left, between him and Obi-Wan. He hates my tea, Anakin explained. Says I make it too bitter. Bitter usually helps one stay awake. That's what I say too but he never listens to me. Oh, I listen to you, Obi-Wan emerged from the kitchen deftly carrying three hot cups in two hands with the ease of one of Dex's droid waitresses. I simply cannot abide by foul tea. How was your training with Master Yoda? It went smoothly, Anakin said after a sip. It was challenging seeing through the signatures of all the plant life at first but that shouldn't be a problem tomorrow. Quite so, Master Windu replied, activating the holo projector showcasing the inner and outer workings of 500 Republica. All one thousand some stories of it. With a flick of his wrist, the schematic focused on Central Level 500 where one of many security rooms was situated. Obi-Wan and I will begin our questioning there, the room is completely isolated, only one way in or out. The investigation is so far being kept a script secret between Chancellor Palpatine himself and members of the Council. Izzard provided for us a complete schematic of the structure and suggested various points from which to conduct our questioning. I see, Anakin looked from one to the other. You're planning on letting the residents go about their business normally, then when tomorrow's Senate session is complete, initiate a lockdown of the building. Precisely, Master Windu nodded. Not even security is being tightened in the meantime. Not from what anyone living there can notice, anyway. Everything must appear normal to ensure no one sees anything suspicious and tries to escape from us. Certain individuals with physical attributes not fitting the footprints we believe belong to Sidious will be left alone, Obi-Wan said, handing Anakin a data pad of those deemed potential suspects. They shall be allowed to enter and exit the building at their leisure. Just a glance at the number of people left who could fill Sidious's position made Anakin's head hurt more than hours of intense force concentration did. Politicians of varying ranks, their own personnel, businessmen, celebrities and even security personnel. However, one thing he did notice was a great number of senators, even ones who'd fit the footprints, being left exempt. The footprints weren't our only criteria, Obi-Wan explained, reading Anakin's expression. According to the autopsy reports performed on Dine and the investigation team, they were killed during the early hours of Coruscant's attack. Much of the Senate was in session when the separatists struck, Master Windu said. And from various cameras and reports, we can verify they wouldn't have been there soon enough to perform the act. Indeed, 
Many of those who attempted to reach 500 Republica were shot out of the sky before getting anywhere close to it. Like Bail Organa and Padme, Anakin said, momentarily surprised by the ease of which he spoke about his wife in front of them before scrolling on. Among the top suspects was one name he was not surprised to find, knew would be there but still dearly wished it wasn't. Chancellor Palpatine left the session early, he was there a good two hours before the first engagements started. Yet, there is one other who may fit even better, Master Windu said with some reluctance, exchanging glances with Obi-Wan. Mas Amada. While many of the senators escaped to 500 Republica, the vice-chancellor and others hunkered down in one of many bunkers situated underneath the rotunda. They didn't come out until Palpatine himself was 100% confirmed to be safe in our hands. And with Sidious being here for who knows how long, there may be tunnels connecting 500 Republica and that bunker, Anakin continued. Such as one to allow a Sith Lord to reach 500 Republica murder people hot on his trail and return to safety while no one is the wiser. Master Windu concluded. These and many other candidates amidst countless more deliberations and speculations continued long into the night. Some more plausible than others. Some bringing more tensions out than the rest. Yet, when the time came to part, all three Jedi, in silence, to one another and to the rest of the galaxy, split apart and went to sleep with a non-spoken view to reveal the truth. No matter how painful or shocking it may be for some of them, they could do no less as Knights of the Republic.